All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Oh, the microphone is important. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout, the October 31st, 2014 edition, uh, which I guess we are going to describe as uh, one of the worst weeks <coughs> we've experienced in in spaceflight for years and years. So, uh, so joining me this week, we've got Sandy Springman. Hey, Sandy, that's very festive of you. Thank you. I guess I was the only person who got the memo that it was Halloween. I sent the memo to everybody, including myself, and nobody got it. <laughs> um, we got Morgan Redberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. And we've got Ramin Skiba. Hey, Ramin. Hi, Fraser. Yep, no custom for me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ken Creamer, who is a writer for Universe Today and happened to be at the uh, the Antares launch, uh, is trying to join us, but this is his first hangout, and so you know how this goes with the first hangout. Technical issues uh, are the rule of the day, and so it's going to be tough. So, um, so let's just get right into the big, big story, which is breaking... As we speak right now, um, which is that it appears, or fairly confirmed, that Spaceship Two has crashed, and there is possibly one fatality uh, associated with that. So, um, who who has been tracking this story? I, I guess everyone's been tracking it. Who's yeah. been paying attention to Twitter? It's not a good day to be in the Mojave. Um, so Virgin Galactic was testing Spaceship Two, um, and there was a tweet earlier about a serious anomaly, and people saw two um, parachutes come out of um, the plane, and there was uh, probably two pilots on board, but no one's confirmed, and one pilot apparently is okay, um, but there's no word on the second pilot, and there's debris that came from the the, um, the vehicle. Uh, it's crashed into the Mojave, and I think they're apparently testing engines. They're testing a new engine on the sp on spaceship too, and uh, apparently the engine started and then stopped, and then it was not good. <coughs> There's really it's nothing more to say about this, and this is this is yeah. a really bad day yeah. For I mean, this version. Only really um, broke really about half an hour ago. Planes, the whole everyone. And this is, you know, they're preparing for orbital, suborbital flights with a spacecraft, and they're hoping eventually to take passengers on that. Um, and so uh, they were really hoping to have people flying on Spaceship Two by the end of the year. So I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. Yeah, they had just taken uh, about six to nine months uh, to redesign their engine um, to make it lighter uh, and use a more fuel-efficient type of propellant. Um, that had been tested for the last year or so on the ground, and this was supposed to be the first uh, in-flight test of that new engine. Wow. Not a good day. No. Um, well, there's not really so a lot to I think say about this yet, aside from this is really bad. Yeah. So I, th I think you know we haven't had many. I think this is the first time for the weekly space hangout that we've had sort of a disaster unfold. Well, this is you know this is. This is probably the biggest disaster that's happened since we began the weekly space hangout. So, um, uh, so anyway, so why don't we we'll move on on our story? But uh, I know you guys will be sort of keeping one eye on Twitter. So feel free to break in if as any more details unfold over the course of this over the course of this hour as we get through the other stories. Um, and so if anyone has any news, please let us know. I know um, I've in, I've implemented the Q and A app. So you, if you're watching the video right now, you can go in there and you can put in that um, that Fraser is interacting with the audience and you can ask questions. But in addition to asking questions, if you have any information that maybe we're going to miss, any details, any links to stories, things like that, by all means, use the Q&A app to put it there or um, uh, send a tweet. I know Sandy is an easy one to remember. S O N D Y. So she is probably going to be watching her Twitter, uh, and so you can, you know, you can send a tweet to Sandy or Morgan or me or or uh, Ramin, and we can sort of try and sort of stay on top of the news and try and give more context as as this uh, episode unfolds. Uh, but why don't we move on to the other disaster then this week, and uh, we'll sort of talk a bit about that. So Morgan, uh, the Antares launch. Yeah. So uh, the. Um, Orbital Sciences uh, Antares rocket was due 
to launch uh, the Cygnus capsule to the space station earlier this week uh, with basically a, a standard resupply to um, the space station containing food, water, equipment, a few uh, new science experiments, uh, when it failed uh, almost immediately after liftoff. Um, and I was actually uh, traveling when this happened, so I think probably somebody else uh, has a few more details than I do about exactly uh, what transpired as far as we know so far. I, I saw a little bit of the uh, press conference um, that NASA had afterward. Um, and so, yeah, apparently, it, and I saw a video, it exploded something like six seconds after launch. They're calling it a launch mishap because it didn't make it very far, obviously. And um, as you said, there was debris from the equipment and experiments and everything um, spread all over uh, the land and the water because it was off the coast of Virginia. Um, and in fact, they're also saying, you know, if, if, if any of the debris washes on shore, you know, don't touch it, basically <laughs> give it to NASA, they're, they're conducting an investigation. So um, along with the, the other disaster this week, they basically we don't know exactly what happened and um, we will find out more in the coming weeks as they conduct their investigation. So we just, sorry, someone just tweeted at me that the Highway Patrol reports one fatality and one major injury after the Spaceship 2 accident. Wow. Not, okay. not good. Um, yeah, and and this was and so we had Ken lined up to join us, and uh, you know for whatever technical reason he wasn't able to join us. But um, I'm going to share uh, share a couple of his pictures here. Um, so now it's just to be clear, this was an unmanned rocket. Right. No so, one was hurt. Uh, you know, nobody was hurt, and nobody was hurt in the disaster. Nobody was hurt in the explosion. Um, and and I'm I, you know, I know a lot of us have had a chance to watch the video and the. The rocket just went up, maybe three or four rocket lengths, and then just stalled, and then started to come back down and and detonated. And from what I had heard, they uh, I guess the controllers had had fired off its uh, self destruct to prevent to limit the damage wow. of it that sort of landing. Um, and what's quite impressive already is they've um, uh, they've released images of the. I guess they've released images of the landing facility, and it it there's some damage, but it doesn't look that bad actually. And, uh, and again, Ken, <laughs> Ken, and but but the other part that was really impressive, I don't know if you saw this. Uh, there was a video that went around of the journalists who were at the site when the explosion happened, and you know for them it really seemed like it was just the apocalypse because. Uh, and if I don't know, if, if, Sandy, I don't know. If, have either of you guys ever attended a launch before? Not no. from the press viewing area, which is closer than the uh, science viewing area. Well, that, that's the thing, right? So the press viewing area is extra close, and so if you're in the press viewing area, you are as close as they will let you get and be able to take take footage of this. And this is why Ken's pictures are so impressive. Um, you know, you're surprisingly close to the rocket when it's when it's going off, and so when this thing exploded, it was incredibly loud, filled a huge field of their view, and and at that point, you don't really know what's gonna what's gonna happen. How's this? You know, how's this thing gonna? Where is this thing gonna land? So, you know, is there any? You know, what do we know about the orbital, the Antares rocket? Does anyone sort of know what these are? So I thought this was the third rocket that they that Orbital Sciences had launched, right? And so I don't know if the other ones were like this or not. Um, and so I don't remember if you said Morgan, but the uh, this equipment was bound for the uh, um, the International Space Station, where there are astronauts there that were you know waiting for the equipment. That's um, correct. And, and so uh, yeah, so there have been successful launches before, but I don't know if the other rockets were the same as this one or not. And the rocket itself is actually a um, it's a modified Russian booster that's actually been around for for a while, and so I think they've they've purchased and repurposed these as as uh, U.S. rockets to to service the space station. Um, so it's a, it's sort of a <laughs> it's kind of a I mean as it is it's, a, it's been a bad week for. I guess for private space flight, when you look at what's happened with SpaceX, and then we look at what's happened with Orville, because there's really only a couple of ways to get up to the space station. There's the orbital science option, 
there's the Russian options with the Soyuz and the Progress spacecraft, and then there's SpaceX. And, you know, all of the issues that are happening with the Russians right now, the Americans are less and less interested in, in putting all of their uh, hopes and dreams in, in the, the Russian options. And now Orbital's had this mishap, and so I guess it's going to be there's going to be some serious concerns about that. So really, it leaves SpaceX as sort of the final uh, vehicle who is both capable of getting up to the space station, but is also, uh, I guess, palatable to the uh, to the to NASA to the U.S. government. Yeah, there's no doubt that this is uh, going to be a setback for Orbital going forward. Um, Launching rockets is uh, extremely tricky business, uh, but we've gotten a lot better at it over the last couple of decades. For example, the um, the Atlas V, which NASA uses to launch most of its science missions, is now launched about 45 times in a row without any uh, mishaps. And uh, SpaceX, of course, has launched uh, uh, about a dozen times now consecutively without uh, any issues as well. And so when the loss or an air shoe with your rocket uh, results in the complete loss of the payload, uh, there's a strong preference for choosing the safest option. And Orbital's going to have to put in a lot of work now to show that they've corrected whatever the issue was and that their system is top to down uh, as reliable as it can be. So I'm going to share another picture here of Ken's. Uh, so this is the launch pad after the disaster. And um, and you can sort of see the I mean the a lot of the stuff is still standing the water tower, the um, you know a lot of the the structures are all still there. Clearly the, the vegetation is all quite black. And there's another one I'm going to try and find while we're talking that shows the whole facility from air, and so you can kind of see you can see what it looks like. And I guess I mean the fact that they detonated the rocket up in the air really sort of helped minimize the damage to the actual launch facility that, you know, if it was a couple hundred feet in the air when it went off, uh, as opposed to it being a you know bomb on the ground or, or crashing into the ground and the, the fuel hitting everything and, and igniting. So, Yeah, you have to remember that even a normal launch is an extremely violent event. Uh, and so these things are engineered to withstand uh, tremendous temperatures, tremendous pressures, uh, and you know they're designed to be able to put the fire out in an instance just like this, uh, and so it's not like this. You know, launch pad got lucky in surviving. It was designed to survive like this. It was designed to contain the uh, the problem and and make sure that it doesn't spread any farther than absolutely necessary. And it really hammers home. I mean, this and then what we're hearing about Spaceship Two, it really hammers home. This is dangerous stuff. I mean, even the safest, most repeatable, normal launch that you do, there's launch failures. And, I mean, for the amount of reporting that I've done now, I guess we're closing in on 15 years, I must have reported on dozens of launch failures, either, you know, landing, you know, launch pad explosions, explosions in other, in other countries, and, or just rockets not uh, releasing their payloads at the right time or going into the right orbit or being, all of these reasons that a huge percentage of the launches that, that happen fail for various reasons. So it's still an incredibly dangerous uh, process. And so as we, as we push forward, to our, uh, I guess, our future of the the spacefaring future that we all want. It's it's good to just keep in mind just how dangerous this whole process still is. Yeah, as long as we're relying on chemical propulsion, which will be, you know, for the, the rest of everybody's lives who's watching this uh, show right now, we're, we're always going to be dealing with basically controlled explosions, and controlled explosions are, you know, barely controlled at best and will look for any tiny weakness in your control setup and exploit that to disastrous effect. And all we can do is, you know, learn from this one, try to make improvements to the parts that, that were weakened, and, and move on to the next one. So Tom Nathy notes that there's going to be a news conference at 2 p.m. about what happened with Spaceship 2. So I guess that's, that's Pacific time, so that's in about an hour and a half from when we're, when we're recording this. Um, any other, any other comments? Um, 
So Elad Avron asks, what happens when a supply launch to the ISS is canceled for whatever reason? How much redundancy and abundance do the guys on the ISS have before it's critical for them to resupply? Yeah, there's a lot of redundancy because uh, even if you don't have an accident, these things are often postponed for weeks, whether it's bad weather or you know a little nagging mechanical, electronic, or computer problem. It's not at all you know, unusual for these things to be postponed for weeks um, or sometimes uh, even months. And as you did allude to, especially on the space station, we do have multiple uh, vectors to get there. So the uh, Russian progress capsules will continue to fly. Uh, and we have other launch facilities here on Earth. This was being launched from Wallops Island uh, in Virginia. Uh, but we also have, you know, intact and, and ready-to-go launch facilities over in uh, Cape Canaveral. So there shouldn't be any uh, issues for the astronauts on board when something like this happens. Yeah, I actually saw an interview with the astronauts, and they were saying that they've got about six months of supplies. So before there's any real problems. Oh, and of course, uh, they always have enough vehicles on board the space station to return to Earth uh, in the event of something long-term going wrong. So there's nothing like they'd be stranded up there with nothing to eat or drink or breathe. They could always just come home, leave the space station to take care of itself until we could uh, get everything back in order here on Earth. Um, Guido Bieber is noting that the only other lost space transfer to ISS was progress in 2011. Uh, it didn't blow up, but it didn't reach orbit for some reason. So, you know, that one didn't. I didn't remember that one, but uh, but I trust Guido. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just looking at an article on uh, Science Magazine, and so among the equipment included a couple of experiments. One of them was uh, um, an experiment studying solar sails, where uh, you know there's reflective materials that um, harness pressure differences in space caused by uh, the sun. Um, and so it's that would have been a cool experiment, but uh, that that was destroyed. Also, there's something that people were calling brain drain, some Italian um, experiment, which was to uh, so astronauts sometimes report headaches and neurological disorders when they're uh, uh, in, in the absence of gravity. Um, and so there, were, there are these sort of collars that monitor blood flow to learn how blood drains from the brain uh, back toward the heart in the absence of gravity. Um, but again, these uh, aren't these one aren't of the like other experiments. experiments. Yeah, and one of the other experiences that was on board was, I know there was a, a mission from the folks at Planetary Resources, so they, it's not their full ARCID telescope, but they had a they had a precursor experiment that was on board, which I guess was lost, so uh, that is unfortunate. Okay, well, why don't we move on? Um, uh, I don't know, Isani, have you got any updates in the, uh, uh, in the Spaceship 2 coverage that you're watching? Okay. Um, some people are saying things I probably should not, but um, anyway, don't post photos of the second pilot's body. That's not very respectful for the pilot or the pilot's family. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more news soon enough. But spaceflight is still hard. Yeah, spaceflight is hard, yeah. All right, Morgan, well, let's, let's, have, let's have a piece of good news. Um, and let's talk about the uh, Google executive who who uh, free fall from the uh, from the edge of space. Yeah, that's right. This uh, this really came out of nowhere uh, this this week. Um, you might remember two years ago, back in 2012, uh, Felix uh, Braungartner set a new record uh, by uh, jumping a uh, quote from the edge of space from uh, over 125,000 feet in the air, uh, that's about 35, 36 kilometers uh, in the air, and he broke uh, a 50, 60 year old record uh, for the highest altitude space jump, and it was this really big sort of media event, uh, and there was all this video and coverage and everything surrounding that. Uh, and then fast forward to this week, and basically just in a press release, um, a Google executive named Alan Eustace, uh, who is uh, the vice president of knowledge at Google, which is the sort of job title I think we'd all love to have, um, announced that he had, uh, in fact, broken that record by more than 7,000 feet. Um, and so he jumped from 135,890 feet uh, after traveling upwards from the Earth's surface for about two hours and then fell back down to the Earth in uh, just a matter of minutes. And 
but yeah, and this this really came out of uh, out of nowhere, and he he took a very different tact, not only from a pro PR standpoint, but from a technical standpoint for how he uh, broke uh, Brown Gartner's uh, record. You might remember that Felix rode up in this kind of capsule attached to a balloon, and then um, part uh, when he reached the top, he opened the door and you know basically threw himself out. Uh, and that allowed him a relatively comfortable ride up. There was life support, heating, cooling, etc. Uh, in his capsule. Uh, on the other hand here, uh, Eustace flew uh, entirely uh, without a capsule. And I have a picture here that I can, uh, that I can share with, um, with everybody. Um, so you can see him here. He's basically just dangling from the balloon, which is what you see extending vertically up from the middle of the image, uh, just in his spacesuit. Um, and this saved, obviously, a whole lot of weight from the capsule that uh, that Brown Gardner had to uh, had to ride in, but it made it for a much more difficult trip up. Uh, he had to stay there for two hours, almost perfectly still, because his spacesuit didn't have the ability to cool down his body. And even moving around would have been enough to uh, overheat um, him as he as he went up. Uh, so, uh, like the previous one, so far no video has been released showing uh, his. Um, descent to the surface, uh, but this is clearly a big achievement um, in, uh, in high altitude space jumping. Uh, he jumped from uh, just over 40 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, while we often call that the edge of space, it's actually quite a long way away from the, the technical edge of space, which is 100 kilometers. Uh, and so it gives you a sense, basically, of how, uh, how the Earth's atmosphere extends. Well, so uh, Ken has joined us, uh, which Ken, Ken Creamer, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was actually at the Antares launch and took some of the really amazing pictures that were that were there. Uh, Ken, are you able to hear me? Yes, I had to reboot my computer, and I think yes. it's working now. Um, Welcome to the club. I have to find the screen again, but... Um, um. Don't worry about the screen. Uh, I'll find some pictures. You can just look into your into your camera and yeah. you can talk to us. So, um, right. so we sort of covered the Antares explosion already and sort of provided some of the details. But you were at the launch and you were at the press area, which I was mentioning to the to the group here is is a very close place. And so I know that when that explosion went off, you were um, you know it was a little too close for comfort. So can you tell us what happened for you? Yeah. Well, I was at the press site. I've seen. Uh, I've seen the Antares launches previously, so I knew how to compare this one to the to the previous one. We're about 1.8 miles away. It's a beautiful view, unobstructed view to the launch pad, and um, I, uh, you know, we were all thrilled. We had just gone through a scrub of one day. We were all thrilled. Everybody was thrilled. A lot of hard work goes into into doing all of this. And finally, the countdown got to T minus 10, and it cleared and took off, but almost immediately I could tell something was wrong because it just didn't look right. The smoke was much grayer than it should have been coming out of the exhaust. It didn't go off to the side through the flame trench the way it should. It formed a big circle in front of us, and at that point I kind of knew something really bad was going to happen, and, uh, you know, we were all praying. We were stunned, actually. Everybody was stunned. You never expect to see a launch failure. You, you never want to see it. I mean, none of us want to see anything like that. All we want to see is success. But we know, we know that this kind of operation, you're living on a knife's edge. Everything has to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, you can have a catastrophe. So I was hoping that that rocket would fly out of that, that plume, but I really didn't expect that it would, and it didn't. And then... Shortly thereafter, it turned red and orange, and the whole sky was on fire. It was just a swirling mass of hell and war, and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, that sky was on fire. You can't believe it. A few moments later, there was a pressure wave, mild. Then there was a heat wave, like a blast from a a mild blast from a furnace, or, or you, you think of your hair dryer. 
I wasn't sure at first it was real, but everybody else felt it too, so we knew it was real. And then a few moments after that, the whole thing blew up. You know, it had already, there was a smoke cloud, but then the rocket blew up when it was descending to the ground. You could see this in the pictures afterwards. I mean, you know, from a mile, from two miles away, you can see the smoke. But when you actually look at the pictures, or all of our pictures afterwards, you could tell that just the tip of the rocket had actually got out of the plume. Um, and then it descended, of course, it had no more propulsion. I'm sure, well, I would say that it's most likely the engines is the problem. At any rate, they started failing. It fell back to the ground, and that's when the, the total disaster happened. It all blew up. The kerosene and the liquid oxygen ignited, and then the second stage hit the ground, and the rocket hit the ground, and you could see particles smithering, and, and billions of smithereens all over the place. And I think that's you know when people might have gotten a little bit concerned because the sky turned red, and you, know, you are wondering... Uh, I don't think anybody was, well, I, don't, I wasn't scared, but I don't, and I don't know if anybody really was scared, but we were definitely on nerve, we got knot in our stomach. And then, you know, then it was clear what was going on. It wasn't absolutely clear at the beginning, like, I mean, we expected it, but you never, I mean, you never expected something like that to happen. Although when you saw what was going on, you kind of thought, yeah, this is going to be a bad day, but... Pretty much everybody was stunned. You, you're looking at that, especially as a journalist, you don't run away. You look at it to see what's going on. And um, I wasn't taking any more pictures at that point. I was clicking. I was looking at this whole thing. I was clicking on my remote triggers, and I'm looking at this whole thing as it's unfolding, praying. And, and unfortunately, it was a terrible day. So then uh, the NASA escort started yelling and screaming. You could hear that if you listen to my video and the other videos. Um, they, they did a fantastic job getting us out of there. Every time before we go to a launch at Wallops, they always read you know, a, a, a safety, safety sheet to us, what to do in case of a launch emergency. And, you know, never happened before, but it happened this time. They were very professional. They got us on the bus. We take a bus to get out there. We had to take a bus to, to evacuate, leave everything in place. And uh, pe people were walking. People weren't running. There wasn't really any panic, I would say, although some people were extremely upset. One woman was crying, at least, that I know a friend of mine. She was really overcome by the whole thing. Uh, everybody was, was, I would say, distressed. Some people were very emotional. And, you know, I never want to see anything like that again. It was, it was terrible. It was a terrible day because we also realized you know, what the consequences are. The space station is counting on these deliveries. We can't have a successful space program if we don't have these cargo runs. So every launch that happens, you know there's just, there's just a tiny little difference between success and total failure. And unfortunately, we experienced total failure, and it was actually beyond anything I could have imagined because I've never seen a, a launch disaster. Very few of the people I was with have seen a launch disaster. The last one was probably uh, 20, 1997, whatever that is, almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago, when uh, and a Delta blew up at uh, a Delta II blew up at um, Cape Canaveral. So it's a long time since we've had a launch failure like this in the United States. So and we so get back to Ken, the press I know you were able to. And then, yeah, you're uh, able to go back to the press site, right? after that. And so you were able to go back, like, what, the next day and gather up your gear and... A couple and hours later, see the... couple hours later, five yeah, or six okay. hours and later. He... And then by then it was apparent what happened. Um, like I, said, I just posted a, a picture. I got to the next day, the next morning, I went to uh, another area where you can view it also from about two miles away from, from the side. You get a side view. It's immediately obvious, actually, from the pictures what, what damage happened. Two of the lightning masts were blown away. That's very obvious. And the and the launch, the transporter erector, they roll the rocket out to the pad, and then it's then it's raised. And that clearly was damaged too. But two of two of two of the two of the lightning arresters were destroyed. And when you look in the pictures, you can actually see them flying away. Uh, you look clearly, and there's, there's birds flying there too, but very clearly, if you look close, you can see them flying away. 
Uh, there was also some scorching on the giant water tower. That's like the biggest water tower, one of the biggest water towers in, in the United States, perhaps the largest one on the whole East Coast. It's there to deluge um, the, the launch pad with water because there's tremendous heat and pressure during a normal launch, so they, they have to cool it with that water. That wasn't toppled, but two of the lightning masts were. And then there's a, there's a, a uh, they also launched sounding rockets there. That was, that was blown, one of the sides was blown away. I'll have that picture online shortly. Fortunately, the, the horizontal integration facility, the HIF where these rockets are put, put together a mile away, that survived intact. There's no visible damage that I could see. And um, so in the tank farms, we'll see. From the NASA footage, it looks like they survived, but there's certainly some damage to that too. At least they, at least they didn't blow up. Some of them still holding pressure, but others, others we'll see. We'll just have to see what happens. So there is damage. It's actually less than I think many of us would have expected, but this is definitely a serious setback to the program. So, so what happens now? Speaking of setback. Um, uh, obviously, there's going to be an investigation. Obviously, uh, Orbital is sort of going to be in the uh, you know, under the spotlight now. If you know their future launches need to be safe, so so what's what's going to happen now? Well, what's going to happen now is first the investigation. They have to determine the root cause. I mean, uh, the engines are a prime suspect. Clearly, in the pictures, you can see there's an explosion at the bottom of the rocket. The rest of the rocket is intact. The top is intact, so it's not like it veered out of control. It did not veer out of control. There was no explosion in the upper stages. Everything happened at the bottom, and then there was an expanding fireball after that. So they got to determine the root cause of the problem. Now, we already know that these engines have problem. First of all, um, they are 40 year, about 40-year-old 40 engines that have been rebuilt and Americanized by Aerojet and then purchased by uh, Orbital Science, and there's a pair of a pair of them, uh, these AJ-26 engines, and originally NK-33 engines that launched, uh, uh, that were designed to launch the Soviet moon program, uh, their, 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 their moon rocket, the N-1, the equivalent of the Saturn V. So they've got to determine if it was the engine or some other cause, possibly a breach in the lower stage, but so they've got to determine the root cause. They've got to determine how they can fix that root cause. And then they've got to qualify those corrections and um, uh, in the engines and, and whatever else they determine was the problem. And that is going to take many, many months. It's going to be weeks of investigation and then weeks and months of, of analysis and followed by more weeks and months of qualification. And then they have to decide are they going to continue using these engines or are they gonna buy a new engine they have orbital has already announced that in a second generation Antares they will purchase new engines they're not gonna build a series of, of uh, new AJ-26 engines I believe they have the blueprints for that the license to do that or they could license them to be bought purchased in Russia but they're not gonna do that they're gonna come up with some completely new engine which they haven't identified yet but uh, until until um, you know they can satisfy NASA and the uh, and the FAA who who license these launches that there isn't going to be any launches. Uh, my my prediction is it'll be a good, it'll be a good year. It could even be longer than that. But it's many many months. The the next launch hadn't been scheduled for six months anyways. And uh, you have to also remember that these engines have had problems. That one of them blew up as I wrote about a few months ago. One of them blew up on a test stand. Was completely destroyed at a test stand down at uh, NASA Stennis. They've only just gotten the, the test stand back in shape. And so the engines they have left all have to be qualified. And, and the launch that would have been in January has already been delayed to April. That was before this disaster happened. Because they haven't been able to qualify new engines because the test stand was severely damaged. So um, whether they decide to go ahead with these engines or not, that, that's going to be a big decision. If they decide that they're going to abandon these engines completely and go to the new engine, that'll be even a further delay. They're talking about like two years, but I think it could be significantly longer than that if they have to develop a new engine because you've got, you got tremendous development work that you have to do and you don't even have an engine yet. So the quickest path will be to find and correct the AJ-26s, but whether they go ahead and do that or not, that's a decision between Orbital, Aerojet, 
and NASA will have to decide to do that. So we are talking about significant. So what are we left with now? We're left with only SpaceX to get cargo to the space station. Everything is going to hang on SpaceX as far as U.S. cargo deliveries. The next one of those is no earlier than December 9th, and I hope to be down there for that. Their cargo manifest may change a little bit. In fact, it will change a little bit, but probably not too significantly from what was already planned. But you can bet that the, the, uh, the eye is going to be on SpaceX to make sure they operate carefully. They also had an engine failure a few months ago, you may remember, with their, uh, their reusable Falcon rocket um, back over the summer sometime with one of the Merlin 1D engines. And so, you know, there has been a serious mishap. That was not in a flight engine, but that was in a test engine. So just to make that clear. But if they have a problem, if SpaceX has a problem, then we're really in serious shape because we have no way to launch uh, cargo. We already can't launch crew. Then we would have no way to launch cargo. But, you know, let's be optimistic and hope SpaceX, pray that SpaceX doesn't have a problem. But they're going to have to take up the slack because now um, we'll only have half the cargo deliveries that were expected by the space station at least for the next year, as, at least as far as what comes from the United States. So this is going to have, you know, reverberations down the line. There, there's a lot of impact here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, your coverage has been absolutely fantastic, and I highly recommend if people haven't already um, – your, I mean, you've been reporting a lot of stuff for Universe Today, and I know you've been on, you've been doing interviews on NBC and ABC, um, and your website is KenKramer.com, Ken Kramer. right? All E's, yeah. KenKramer.com. And yeah, yeah I, I know you about this for Universe Today. I was on NBC Nightly News uh, the night before last about this. They yeah. did show my pictures. I have seen these engines. Those are my exclusive photos. No one else has seen what I've seen, as far as I know, as far as the media goes, of course. You know that their own people have, but as far as the media goes, I have many exclusive pictures. And um, Orbital does a great job, but they've got a they've got a tough task ahead of them. And I will have further articles in detail, more in detail about the AJ26 engines and the consequences of what's to come. Yep. Um, like I said, I just posted one picture, a very short story right now about the damage. I have more pictures coming up kind of ran out of time just before this this hangout started so so that's coming up um, and you know we have commercial crew written a lot about that for universe today interviewed those people and that you know launch abort system better work because here's why we have a launch abort system this is a wake-up call to everybody why you need a launch abort system for people because if there is no launch abort system or it malfunctions those astronauts would be killed you know terribly so that launch abort system has to work, and they're going to have to think about how they do that because the launch abort system, these commercial crew capsules, they're actually feeding off the fuel from the exploding rocket if something happens. So, um, you know, I, I I wonder about that. But yeah, well, but we've got Orion, to, we're running out of this. time. The so Orion, we've got to... Okay, let me just say this: the Go Orion ahead. has a launch yeah. abort system on the top, and it pulls the capsule away. All right, and that flight is coming up EFT one critical flight coming in in uh, December 4th, actually just days before the SpaceX flight. So we've got a lot of critical things uh, coming up in the next few months for, for both manned and unmanned, and these have reverberations for, for all of our, our, our manned space programs. Well, thank you again for joining us, Ken, and we really look forward to your coverage, your, you know, really gripping stuff, and thanks for, for bringing that, uh, that personal experience just today. It was, uh, you know, nothing that we, you know, any of us had sort of just watched this on, on television and on, on the Internet, so for you to be able to give us that experience is just wonderful. Um, and now I'm, I'm sure you're following the, uh, the Spaceship 2 disaster that's going on as well. So, I don't know, Sandy, is there any more... Details. I know. I just saw. Um, so we have an internal chat for Universe today, and uh, Nancy, our editor, was mentioning that uh, the FAA has actually issued a statement as well. So that's that's been brought into the story that Nancy's working on over on Universe today. Is there any more any more updates at all? Uh, I have CNN on here just now. No, I don't see any further update. They they are confirming that there is one dead and one severely injured. And this is, you know, a tremendous setback for uh, commercial space flight. Um, but we can't give up. Here's my message. We can't give up. Too many people 
in this country and throughout the world, they just want to give up. We can't do that. The only way our country will advance is when we invest in science and technology, when we push the bounds. Okay? Otherwise, we will never advance as a species. So these people like, like Branson and, and Musk and the people at Orbital and the people in commercial crew, they need to be applauded, but they also need to make sure they do everything safe. Okay? And, and that is the only way to progress. The worst thing to do in any of these instances is to just give up and surrender. Okay? You don't inspire so the next generation by giving up. You've got to push forward, and you have to do that, and you cannot give up. So I've got a picture here of the crash site. Looks and pretty I've bad. Taken a look. Yeah, and I've taken a look, and I, you know, it's I don't see any like any bodies or anything in there. But um, well, I think they've recovered one this. body already. And, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to share this picture so people can see. Um. Yeah, yeah. So people can see this. Yeah, that's kind of like it's on its side there. That's a crash. Yeah, that's a crash. That's a deadly crash. Yeah, one of the pilots ejected. I think the other one did not, sadly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it just highlights, you know, space is a risky business. It'll never be routine. Some people call it routine, and that is just a, a huge So, um, a few more pieces of information. Uh, Nancy was saying uh, that Nancy Atkinson, our, our senior editor at Universe Today, Saying she's repeating, reading reports that they were in powered flight for a while, and other reports happened shortly after ignition. So they're still not sure whether the explosion happened after they switched to powered flight, or if they had already been operating in powered flight for for some time, and then uh, had this had this disaster happen. So. You know, we're going to try and look for the, anything to sort of provide some insight on that. Um, why don't we move on briefly? Uh, there's sort of I'm, going to, I'm jumping around, and obviously it's a very special day today. Um, which is that we have some. Uh, you know, we always like to involve the the folks from the Weekly Space Hangout crew, and this is this special uh, community on Google Plus where people like to share about these stories and, and the stories that we cover in the in the Weekly Space Hangout. And as always. Um, uh, Nancy Graziano, the uh, the moderator of the forum, has pulled together a bunch of suggestions from folks at the WSH crew, and a few of the stories uh, we wanted to cover in that. Um, one is the fact that uh, SpaceX announced that they're going to be attempting to do a landing of the Falcon, the Falcon 9, on a platform uh, over the course of this, I think, uh, in the next few months. So, uh, Morgan, you were looking into that. Yeah, so SpaceX's ultimate goal here is to launch the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, put their payload into space, and then safely return at least part of the Falcon 9 to the launch pad where it can be refurbished, refueled, and used again. And they've been working over the last couple of years to sort of build up to this. They started with this grasshopper rocket, a smaller rocket that they showed that they could uh, go up, hover, and return safely. Uh, and with that, they're practicing things like internal guidance of these rockets to get them back to the launch pad. And then they moved on to putting fins or landing pad gear onto the Falcon 9 itself and attempting to more or less hover over the ocean's surface after um, doing commercial SpaceX launches. Uh, and their next step is to actually try a landing. And before they try to land on a launch pad where, as we've seen this week, uh, mishap can lead to a lot of collateral damage, they're going to try to land on uh, a pad in the ocean. So the idea is they'll have a, a floating launch pad that's a, the order of 150 feet by 150 feet floating in the Atlantic Ocean. And after the launch uh, this December to the space station, they will attempt to bring the, the Falcon 9 down to a launch or to a landing on that pad. Uh, and this is going to be an exceptionally difficult thing to do, perhaps even more difficult than landing on land itself, because you can imagine that the uh, launch pad will be pitching and rolling. It'll be somewhat similar to trying to land uh, a plane on an aircraft carrier as opposed to uh, a, a normal land-based runway. And because of this, uh, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk is pinning... Uh, less than a 50% chance that this actually works uh, on the first try. 
But if they do succeed, or when they do succeed, whether it takes one attempt or a number of attempts, uh, they'll be able to demonstrate that they can land under conditions uh, as difficult or more difficult than the ones anticipated uh, for return to Cape Canaveral. Uh, and with, with that demonstration, uh, that'll satisfy the Air Force's uh, requirement, basically, that they demonstrate they can do this uh, under uh, realistic conditions. And then they've already said that they'll be allowed to begin to attempt to land uh, on, on the ground. Uh, and, I mean, I mean, if they can perfect this technology, it just gives them an even further boost ahead compared to the competition. I mean, no one else can do, can do this. And the cost savings, if, they, if they're able to reuse that bottom stage of the rocket, will be really significant. And, uh, and that just continues their sort of dominance in this, in this field. And, I mean, a great technical accomplishment. I mean, the next step, of course, is for them to get that second stage landing safely as well. So... Uh, Musk is aiming to uh, reduce the cost of a SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 launch by up to 90% from the current cost of about $85, $86 million, which is already uh, about the most cost competitive of the uh, low Earth orbit launch options. Just amazing. Uh, so we've got a couple, few questions for Ken that have per, you know, come through the Q&A app. So Ken, you got you got a few more time to take some questions here. Sure. Um, Absolutely. So uh, one comment was you were talking about the um, uh, the pay, I guess the escape mechanism that some of the future rockets will have is right. how feasible would it be to incorporate a payload escape mechanism similar to that in place for crew capsules so I guess a way that the, the you know these well, that's what I was saying at the end that we yeah. do have a payload escape mechanism but it's a it's a totally different kind uh, there's a pusher abort system on these on these commercial crew capsules from Boeing and from SpaceX for the Dragon and the CST-100. Whereas NASA is using a, an abort system that pulls the rocket off the top. Okay, at a, it's got a half a million pounds of thrust. The launch abort system, which I've written about extensively at Universe Today, also it's a different type of escape system. So the point is. There are escape systems, but there are different kinds of types of escape systems. And I think that the escape system, perhaps for these commercial crew vehicles, they got to make sure that uh, that it's really going to work because the consequences of not working are, are just catastrophic. What I saw with my own eyes, I mean, the, these things have to work in a split second. All right, so there's two different types. One pushes from the bottom, the other one pulls from the top. And I'm just saying, I think that NASA and and uh, these commercial crew companies will need to evaluate, reevaluate the effectiveness of their escape systems, because um, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so Guido Bieber asks. Um, so in light of the Antares blow up, it maybe wasn't a good idea for ESA for ESA to discontinue their ATV launches, but that had been decided a long time ago. Well, so the ATV. Okay. You want to get into that? I totally agree with that. I don't know why they stopped that. To me, that was a very short-sighted decision. They did it for money reasons. Now they're going to put their money into um, into building service modules for Orion based on the ATV. And that's that's great. However, they still have to. There are barter agreements, and they still have to somehow uh, come up with their portion of the costs for the space station. If they're not going to supply, um, if they're not going to supply cargo via the ATV, they got to do it somewhere else. And for presumably be with Orion. But I agree with this. I don't think yeah. it should have stopped. But let's get further into this. This is why the space shuttle shouldn't have been stopped in the first place. We were totally dead in the water, okay, when the space shuttle stopped and we couldn't launch a mouse into space. We couldn't launch commercial, we couldn't launch crew or cargo. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of implications for doing this, okay? So I was totally against shutting the shuttle down, and this is exactly why. Um... All right. Since for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the ATV was the European Space Agency's uh, was it asynchronous or a automated transfer vessel? Automated transfer, transfer vessel. Vehicle. The Japanese yeah, and so have their HTV, and they were thinking of potentially stopping that as well. But it looks like from the latest uh, conversation I've had with uh, NASA top NASA officials that the Japanese will probably continue with their unmanned transport vehicle, but. You know, we got to have a way. There are no resources in space. We have to be able to 
have independent ways for the different countries and the different space agencies to get their crew and cargo to space. You can't be reliant on a single system. It's just total foolhardy to do that. So one last comment. This comes from Nancy Graziano, which is that early reports are that some of the experiments in payload may be salvageable. Have you heard that at all? That some, well, some of the payloads might be recovered. I just read that some of those pieces were recovered. I would doubt that anything would be reusable. They're they are, they are, um, I know for a fact, because I, my remote camera is still out there. The NTSB was there yesterday. They're analyzing the debris field. They're, look, they're cataloging everything that's there. They're going to start collecting things. Of course, there's materials that survived. There were experiments that survived from the Columbia accident. Um, but, but I don't think they will ever be reused. No, I don't think so. They'll be analyzed, and people will learn from it. Um, but I, I would doubt any of it would be reused. It's just being recovered to aid the accident investigation and maybe plan for contingencies in the future. All right, so we're That's kind of reaching question. the end of our, of our hour, So, um, and I know you've, you've all got to get back to your work and some of the reporting you do, so I think I'm going to wrap the episode up now. Uh, I know there's a bunch of stories that we wanted to get to, but obviously this is sort of a very special day, and so we uh, sort of go with what we've got. Um, so uh, so before we go, though, I want to give uh, everyone a chance to sort of let people know where they can find out more. So, Sandy, uh, where do we find out more Sandy? I am on Twitter, at Sandy, and uh, if you're in the Tucson area, I'm giving a talk um, a week from today at the um, Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Um, so that will be at the, um, at this, uh, I think it's over in the Stewart Observatory. Fantastic. Come say hi. If, if you're one, not in town, send your friend. If one Googles, one might have seen some of Sandy's talks in the past, perhaps on the YouTubes. So they're on, they're on the YouTubes. Um, Ken, uh, so we mentioned this earlier, but uh, what are some other places that people can follow what you're doing and, and make contact with you? Um, well, you can look at my website. I do give lectures for people who are interested and sponsor me. I just gave a lecture at Princeton University exactly about human space flight and, and, these, um, and, the, and these commercial cruise space flights. So I give a lot of lectures about Mars. As you know, I create uh, Mars Mosaics. You can Google my name, actually, and you'll find tons of images and articles I've written. I've got some talks coming up in Pennsylvania. So if you're interested in a lecture, contact me. I give a, a wide range of of talks and um, KenKramer.com, all e all e's. You can get awesome. in touch with me. Morgan, uh, where do we find out more? Yeah, you can find me uh, at Morgan Renberg on Twitter, uh, or read some of my writings at CosmicChatter.org. And I'll be over in the uh, Google Plus Space community after this if we want to cover uh, any of the stories we didn't get to today that were on our docket, or if you had any other questions that we also didn't get a chance to answer today. Yeah. Uh, Ramin, where do we find out more? Uh, so I'm at Ramin Skiba on Twitter, and my blog is raminskiba.net, where I also have links to some articles I've written and... Oh. Oh, there's a disruption in the force. Uh, so uh, we'll wrap this up. So again, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and uh, you can uh, find me on the Twitters at fkane. I lost my uh, my little lower third there, um, as well as we're of course publishing uh, lots and lots of um, uh, videos on YouTube, and so we just released one about what strange places in the solar system are habitable, uh, and how big is the Big Dipper. So you can find out information about that. Uh, so coverage of the uh, Spaceship Two disaster is going to be continuing over on Universe Today, and we're going to be updating this, of course. Uh, all day today, and, and obviously this will be a key focus of our reporting for the next couple of weeks, so so by all means go and, and check out what we're doing over on, on Universe Today. Join Morgan in the Google Plus Space community and, and throw your zingers at him, as well as uh, in a, every week I want to make this uh, reminder to go and join the WSH Crew space community uh, over on uh, on, on Google+. Plus, It's sort of the core fans of the show, and a lot of the names that you hear us mention every week are, are very active there, and it's a great place to go and sort of 
Uh, share your love of space and astronomy with other like-minded people. They are super welcoming and, and really great people to work with, and I really appreciate all the support they give us for doing this show. Um, we really, honestly, seriously could not do this without you folks, uh, and so thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap this up, so uh, thanks to everyone who watched. Thanks to everyone who uh, joined us for the panel this week. I know it was a little strange, uh, and we will uh, we'll give you an update next week.